You have no idea how a sermon's going to go when it starts with that bumper. <laughs> We're just going to see how this plays out from this point. Uh, I may just throw away all the notes I have at this point. Uh, well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Ephesians chapter 1. For the next six weeks, we're going to be working through the six chapters of this book, which is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. And you need to understand that the church in Ephesus had a lot of connections to Paul. Paul had actually founded the church 11 years before he wrote this letter. So these Ephesians in this church, they would have come to know Jesus initially when Paul came and preached the gospel and started the church. And then he came back a couple of years later and actually lived there for about three years and served as the pastor of the church. So really connected. You can actually read about Paul's time as the pastor in the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. The historian Luke tells us that God did really amazing things during that period of time. The amazing miracles were done through Paul. Um, it says that people would actually bring articles of clothing like handkerchiefs and aprons to him, and he would just touch those, and then they could take them out and heal the sick with those items, which can give modern preachers a little bit of an inferiority complex because I can't heal anybody by touching clothes. Uh, I do tell funny stories sometimes, so I've got that going for me. But Paul has a special connection with this particular church, and he's writing to some people that he knows very well. But the city of Ephesus, I want to tell you just a little bit about it so you can get an understanding of, of the context of this letter, it was a big commercial city. It was probably the second uh, most famous city at the time, right behind Rome. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. There were about 350,000 people that lived there, which for that period of time was amazing. That was a metropolis back then. They had running water. They had working toilets in parts of the city, in the first century. My mom didn't have an indoor toilet when she was growing up in East Tennessee in the 1950s, just to give that some perspective. So it was this incredibly populous and progressive city. I, I want to show you a couple of pictures just so you can get a sense of the city. The first thing is it had a stadium that seated about 25,000 people. There's what the ruins look like of that stadium today, so you can get a sense of that. It also had an amazing library, one of the most famous libraries in the ancient world called the Library of Celsus, and that's what the remains, that's what it still looks like today, so you can just get a little sense of what it must have looked like back at the time that Paul wrote this letter. The most famous building in the city of Ephesus was a temple to the goddess Artemis. She was the Roman goddess, she was the patron goddess of the city, and this is what the ruins look like today, so you can't really tell much about it, but here's a depiction of what it would have looked like back at the time. Get us, yeah, it's actually known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so because Artemis was the patron goddess of the city, she filled their worship. And so the temples would have had male and female prostitutes, uh, and the religious festivals in the city would have been filled with eroticism and cultic prostitution and sexual immorality. Ephesus was a place where sexual immorality was normalized. It was celebrated. It was politicized. Does that sound familiar at all? It's a place with great luxury and convenience and temptation. Ancient Ephesus looked a whole lot like modern America. And so this letter that Paul wrote them could have also been addressed to the churches in Houston and in Katy. Some of all, uh, Paul's other New Testament letters were written to churches to deal with a specific problem or some issue but that's not what Paul is doing here. He is writing to remind these Ephesians about the basics or the core of the gospel. He's reminding them about grace in action. And so he's going to spend the first three chapters talking about what's been done for us, how we've been saved by grace through faith, and who our identity is through that process. And then he's going to spend the last three chapters or the second half of his letter talking about how we live that out how we show grace to others, and how our behavior follows out of that grace that we've been given. So many of you guys grew up in a church that probably had this backwards. Some of you guys may have grown up in a church where it was all about rules. And, and so every Sunday you were made to feel like you weren't good enough, that you had done not good enough the last week of trying to fill all the rules. And so you felt the, the, the pressure and the weight of always trying to be good enough to earn God's favor. But Paul doesn't start out this letter with rules. He spends the first half 
talking about who we are. He talks about our identity. And then he gets to how our behavior, how we live, flows out of that identity. You know, an identity is actually a pretty big theme throughout all of the Bible. It started at the very beginning in the book of Genesis when God created mankind. And if you look back at Genesis 1:27, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So all the way back to the very beginning of the creation of man, he gave us an identity. He said, we are made in God's image. And then he gave us a gender identity. We are male or female. And I think about all the problems that we struggle with today that would go away if we could live out that identity and if we could treat other people like image bearers of God, like what God says. Then in Ephesians, Paul's going to take this same identity theme up and he's going to tell us who we are through our relationship with Jesus. Let's look at the very, this is, remember, this is the introduction of the letter, the very first words that Paul says in this letter. This is Ephesians 1, 1 through 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the last part of this is a pretty typical greeting for Paul. It's, it says grace and peace. And the reason he would say that is that was a universal greeting. Whether you were Jewish or a Gentile reader, it would address how you would greet one another. So the word grace or charis in the Greek was a typical way that Gentile Roman citizens might greet one another. And peace or shalom in the old uh, Israelite and Hebrew was the way that Jewish people would greet one another. And so he's saying both of those words. But he starts right off the bat talking about our, our identity. He, he says, God's holy people. So that, that's an identity language that he gives us right off the bat. And, and I think about those people in the church of Ephesus and how they might not have felt like that applied to them. Think back, just 11 years before, they would have not even known who Jesus was because Paul hadn't been there to preach that to them yet. And they were living in this culture of Ephesus that was filled with eroticism and convenience. And some of the Christians that probably read this letter hadn't even been 11 years as a Christian. They may have just been in the church for a few weeks or a few months. And, and they may not have felt like God's holy people. It may have felt a little like mistaken identity. They may have been thinking, look, uh, maybe this letter was intended to some people in a different church in another city. But some of you may feel the same way when you read that. Because remember, this letter wasn't just written to the ancient holy people in Ephesus. It was written to the holy people here at Kara City in Katy, Texas. And some of you may hear those words and it feels like mistaken identity. That doesn't feel right to you. Maybe when you were singing that first song today about how God has healed the brokenness inside of you, that didn't feel true. You, you still feel more broken than you do healed. And if that's you then you can identify with how these Ephesians must have felt when they read, read this letter 2,000 years ago. Paul also says that they were in Christ Jesus. Huge identity language here. This is the essence of who we are as Christians. We are in Christ Jesus. And we're going to spend the rest of this sermon talking about what this looks like when our identity is truly in Jesus. What does that mean? All right. In the next section of the letter, we're going to see a lot more of this identity language. And what you're going to see is that this next section is really just one big run-on description of who we are. It's one big identity just that's going to feel like just language thrown at you. Listen to it. This is verse 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, or in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were chosen, 
having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's a mouthful. I had to practice that over and over just to get those words out without fumbling them because it's this repetitive identity language. Did you see that? Did it feel like Paul's just beating you over the head with identity? That's because he is. Paul understood that identity is a really big deal. It it was a big deal 2,000 years ago, and I think it's fair to say it's still a huge deal today. In fact, one of the themes of our modern culture is live out your identity. Be true to who you are. And you know, that's not even bad theology in and of itself. It's pretty good theology. But the problem comes in with who gets to decide what your identity is. Who who decides what your identity is. The modern culture would say, we get to decide. We, We get to decide what brings us passion and pleasure. And that we are deciding those issues, what makes us unique. But the problem with self-proclaimed identity is that we struggle to figure out what it is. We don't even really fully understand it. And so we try to find our identity by chasing things that we think are going to bring us purpose and pleasure and fulfillment and contentment. But the Bible makes it clear that we don't have to struggle with identity. Our identity has been defined for us. Our identity is in Christ. And that's what Paul is saying over and over in this passage of Scripture. And then Paul says through this passage we just read that when our primary identity is in Christ, then there's some things that are true about us. Here's the first thing. Look back at verse 4. It says, For he chose us in him, or in Jesus, before the creation of the world. We're chosen. When we are in Christ, we've been chosen. Remember back to junior high school when you'd be out at recess and the two best athletes would be picking teams for a game of dodgeball or softball or soccer? And when you're waiting to hear your name, there was this weight, there was this anxiety, this discomfort. Maybe you were at the beginning and you knew you'd be picked really fast or maybe you knew you were going to be towards the end to hear your name. But either way, until you heard your name called, there was this discomfort, And then once your name was called, that discomfort went away because you've now been chosen to be a part of something. And, and, you know, some of you are still living life that way today. You're still waiting to find purpose. You're still waiting to find your identity. You're waiting to be chosen. And Paul says, right at the very beginning of the letter, you don't have to wait. Because when we are in Christ Jesus, we've been chosen. We're a part of something. You know, we so often think of identity as something that we choose, but Paul says that's not right. So we are chosen, and that's a huge difference. In the same verse, Paul says another thing that's true about us when we are in Christ. He says, we are holy and blameless. And I think about how those Ephesians must have thought about that when they heard that. And I'm sure they didn't feel very holy and blameless. And you may be in the same place. You may still be living under the weight of blame. You know, I talked to a lady a couple of weeks ago, and she was telling me her story. She told me that growing up, she grew up in the church, but that their church was very different than our church here at Karis City. And it was all about rules, and it was this God that was not very forgiving. It was a God who was very stern and was never satisfied with what you did. And and so every Sunday, they would come in, and she would feel the weight of not measuring up, of not being good enough. And the challenge each week was go try to be better next week, but you'd show back up at church and you were told you still weren't good enough. And and so she began to live out that. And and even in her home, rules were way ahead of love. And it was always that she was never good enough, that she always brought disappointment, and she just couldn't live up to the expectations. So now that she's a follower of Jesus, she still struggles to think of herself herself as holy and blameless. It's not the way she thinks of herself. And and she also even told me that she struggles to see God as a good God because of what she was taught when she grew up. And maybe you're in that same place. Maybe you're still living under the weight of blame. You still feel that pressure 
of growing up when you were never good enough and your best still wasn't enough. And that history has become a part of your identity. Or maybe you did make some big mistakes and you blame yourself. And, and you're still living in the weight of that failure. It defines who you are. It's become part of your identity. And, and so now you're really sensitive about what people think about you or what they say about you because you know what you've done. Or maybe you just withdraw and you don't even want to hang out with other people because you don't want to know, be around people that know your past. But when you're in Christ, your identity and the truth about you isn't based on what you've done. Instead, it's based on what's been done for you. You are holy and blameless, not because your past conduct deserves to be holy and blameless. You are holy and blameless because Jesus died to make you that way. Jesus lived this perfect life, never made a single mistake. And then he went to the cross and paid the price of your sin as the perfect sacrifice. And because of his sacrifice, when you are in Christ, when you follow him, you are now holy and blameless. Listen how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see the identity language in this verse too? When we are in him, when we are in Christ Jesus, we are holy and pure, not because of our conduct, but because of what he's done. We are the righteousness of God. It's who we are, We're holy and blameless. And the next thing Paul says that's true about you because of your identity in Christ is down in verse 5. Look at that. and says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. We're adopted. We're a part of God's family when we are in Christ. And to understand the context of what Paul's saying, you've got to understand adoption under Roman law. Adoption was a really big deal in the Roman Empire. They didn't just adopt kids in the Roman Empire. They would adopt adults. So like if you were a successful businessman or you were in politics and you didn't have a son to carry on and carry the, the business name and to take care of your, your family's wealth, you might go out and adopt a son who would step in and take over the family business and take over the family name. The most famous example of this is Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar didn't have a son, and so he adopted a, a guy named Octavian, who became his son. Octavian would be the successor of Julius Caesar. He would eventually change his name to Augustus Caesar, and he's the Roman emperor at the time Jesus was born. That happened through adoption. And, and so under Roman law, when you were adopted, and that was complete, you were no longer a part of the family that you were in before, and you became totally a part of the family that you were adopted into. It was so true that even like the debts and obligations, if you owed money under your current, I mean, under your old family, that was abolished. It went away as if it never existed. Some of you guys are thinking, I'm ready to be adopted by somebody right now. But the whole point of that is you were no longer what you were before. You became something new. Do you see that image that Paul's trying to create for us here to help us understand that when we are in Christ, our old identity is gone. That our old things that defined who we are no longer exist anymore, and we are now in Christ. And that's what he's trying to show us. We're sons and daughters of the king. And when I was working on this sermon, I was actually looking through some videos of foster kids when they were told that they were being adopted from, by their family. And I almost played one of those for you, but I didn't want to have to put tissues in every seat because it was going to bring some tears what happens in that moment is there's this incredible emotion and joy because these kids go from not really having a family to suddenly being a part of something special and unique. And it's a big deal. And, and that's what Paul's trying to help us understand. That's what it means when we become in Christ and our identity changes. And if we're honest, some of you guys, you've been waiting for that your whole life, to have someone adopt you, to choose you to love you, not because of what you've done, not because of what you've accomplished, but to love you just because of who you are, to give you unconditional love just because of who you are. That's what Paul's saying when we become in Christ. That's what happens. We're a part of God's family. When we are in Christ, the question we ask ourselves in the morning when we look in the mirror goes from who am I to whose am I? Because we become part of God's family. In this same 
verse, Paul's going to use a word that causes some disagreement among Christians and among churches. And I want to look at that briefly. Uh, He uses the word predestination. He says, in love, he predestined us for adoption. And and so that word has caused some disagreement uh, among modern churches. Now, we're going to talk about that. If you like to go a little deeper doctrinally, you're going to love the next couple of minutes. If you don't like to go deeper, I don't know, think about what you're going to have for lunch or think about this. Was Guardians of the Galaxy 3 better than Guardians of the Galaxy 2? I I think it was, but I think it was a really close call, different reasons. Think about that. But if you want to go deep, let's go deep. It says in verse 5, we were predestined. And this predestined idea is something we see in a couple of places in the New Testament that gives us this idea of, do we choose to follow Jesus or do we really not have any choice in that matter at all? Here's the big theological question that comes up with predestination. Do we choose God or does God choose us? And the answer to that big theological question is both. Both. See, Paul was talking here on predestination about a group predestination. He would have been talking to the Jewish understanding of predestination. Think about that for a second. God chose the nation of Israel to be his people. They didn't pick that. God chose them, and they became God's people. He predestined them to be his people. But when you understand the Old Testament, you understand that not all of the Israelites were actually God's people. True Israelites were the Israelites who had faith, who followed the Old Testament law and honored God through their lives. They were God's people. So God chose Israel, but then individual Israelites would then have to choose whether to follow God because not everybody kept those commands. Let me give you an example of that. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, there were two thieves that were crucified by him. And it is almost certain that both of those thieves were Jewish, because this is in Jerusalem. One of those thieves followed Jesus. He decided to fall on God's mercy and grace and called on Jesus' name. If you remember, the other thief rejected Jesus and actually mocked Jesus. One wound up in heaven with Jesus and the other did not. They were both chosen as part of God's people, but one chose to be a part of that and not the other one. And in the New Testament, Gentiles were added to the group, Gentiles are us, were added to the group of God's chosen people. But we still have to individually choose God as well. Let me give you an illustration that that hopefully helps explain this kind of complex concept. So we planned this sermon series about seven months ago. So seven months ago, I decided that on this day, I would preach Ephesians chapter one to whoever showed up. So you could turn around to the person behind you right now and say pretty accurately, Nathan predestined us to hear Ephesians chapter 1 today at church. And that's true. I I did decide that that was what you would hear. But I didn't decide individually whether you would hear it. I just decided that if you happened to be here in church or you were watching online, that's what we would study. And then when you got up and decided to come to church this morning, even if it was at the last minute when your wife made you feel bad about wanting to go fishing instead, you decided to be a part of this group that was predestined to hear Ephesians chapter 1. In other words, what was predestined for the group became predestined for you individually. But you had to be a part of that choice to be part of this group. And and so so too, from the very beginning of the world, God predestined all of us to be a part of God's holy people, part of his family. But, but he didn't predestine certain people to be a part of that and other people not to be. He, his intent and his plan, his election, was for all of us. Look, there's a couple of passages that make this very clear. One's from the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3.9. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone. The Greek word there that's used is the word pos. That was the original word that was used. And pos literally translates to everyone, which, which is actually why the NIV chose that word, because it's a literal translation. But you're going to see that same Greek word again in John 3.16. This is what Jesus says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
The Greek word that's used there in that scripture, the original word, is the same word, pas. And so it could have just as easily said, everyone who believes. And, and we see this intent by God that everyone is elected. Everyone is predestined to be God's holy people. But it gets even a little more complex than that. Because from the beginning of time, God knows exactly who's going to choose to be part of his family and who's not. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And, and so from the very beginning of time, God elected all of us to be a part of his people, and he knows who's going to decide to accept that and who's not. Clear as mud? Don't say I don't ever go deep in a sermon. There you go. For you non-deep thinkers, it's time to wake back up. Stop pondering lunch. Let's look back at verse 7 and the first half of verse 8 to see another thing that's true about us when we are in Christ. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In Christ, through his blood, through what he did, we are redeemed. We are set free. We are forgiven. We are restored. And there may be some of you that go, I don't think that works for me. I, I, I think I've messed up too bad. I, I don't think you know what I've done. I don't know what you've done. But I know what Jesus did for you. This isn't about what you've done. It's about what was done for you. God's grace is greater than whatever you've done. The Bible is so clear about that. You are redeemed. You're made new. Paul's laying out the good news the gospel, right here in the beginning of the Ephesians. Jesus chose us to be part of his family. And then when we choose him, we're forgiven, we're redeemed from all of our mistakes and our sin. And that's the beautiful picture of baptism that we've gotten to see play out nine times over the last five weeks. I just love seeing that because it's a picture or an illustration of what Paul is talking about here. It's saying that when we become followers of Jesus, when we're in Christ, we die to our old, old identity, just like Jesus died on the cross. We die to our old identity of sin and failure, and we're buried in the water, just like Jesus was buried in the tomb. And then we rise out of the water to this new identity. It's this picture of us being brand new, new creations in Jesus, just like Jesus walked out of the tomb. When we are in Christ Jesus, we're chosen, we're adopted, we're holy, and we're redeemed. Those things are all now true about you because of your true identity. But here's the challenge. You have to accept and live out that new identity. When you have followed Jesus, you still have all of those old identities hanging around, competing for things. You, you have your old past failures. You have the, the, the baggage that you take all the way back to childhood. You also have your old sin struggles that are reminding you how you used to find identity and pleasure and purpose and acceptance. Maybe you've got voices in your head that tell you you're still not measuring up, that you're not worthy. Think about those Christians in Ephesus who were hearing this. They had those pasts that were all tied up in the Ephesian culture. And yet, they now have this new identity. But these identities, their old identities are clashing with their new ones. And I think Paul addresses that at the very beginning of this letter. Let's look back at the very introduction. This is verse 1 of Ephesians. He says, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. I think you see two different identities right here. In Ephesus, in Christ Jesus. And, and so you've got these two competing identities for these Ephesians. And I think for us, you can actually replace the word Ephesus with whatever your old struggles are. You're in those old identities, but you're also in Christ. Maybe it's something for your past that you drag along with you. You know, our past is a part of who we are. I, I grew up in rural Northeast Texas in a little town called Center. And if you think you know where that is, halfway between Houston and Dallas on I-45, that's, that's not Center. That's Centerville, everybody messes that up. Center is not on the way to anything. And there's no reason to go through there. There really isn't. But it's who I am. I haven't lived there for 30 years, but it still makes up a part of who I am. I want to tell you a little bit about the, the town that I grew up in so you can appreciate uh, some of the idiosyncrasies about me. The, the town I'm in, every October, we have something called the Poultry Festival where we celebrate the chicken. 
We do. And so we have a chicken queen. It's a big deal. There's a chicken queen pageant. Now, they call her the poultry festival queen. I call her the chicken queen. But that's elected. We have a chicken clucking contest. And you would think that's just kids that participate. Oh, but it's not. It's a big deal. Adults practice and they get ready because it's a big deal to win that. One of my lifelong friends, who's still one of my very best friends, is the annual MC of that illustrious event. Here's a couple of things I've seen around my hometown over the last few years. At Christmas time, you can drive through and you can see uh, an animated blow-up Santa Claus. But it's a little different than most because as you get near it, driving or walking, Santa bends over, pulls down his pants, and moons you. Now, it's Christmassy, though, because he does have Merry Christmas tattooed on his behind. I've also seen guys riding around in a pickup truck in a make, makeshift hot tub that made it out of a blue tarp and a, a water pump. So these guys, there's three guys wearing bathing suits. I hope they were wearing bathing suits. I can only see the top part. I hope they were in bathing suits. But they're riding around, and literally, they're in this hot tub going 50 miles an hour down the road, water blowing everywhere. Those are the kind of things you can see in my hometown. It's also going to surprise you that Center is actually the biggest town in the whole county. And, and so other people come from smaller towns around there to actually go shopping in Center. Have you ever heard the phrase, Tenaha, Timson, Bobo, and Blair? Anybody heard that? Yeah, a couple people. It's not a very famous phrase, but it's referring to some small towns near Center. There's a couple other small towns near Center. One, one is named Possum Trot. not making this up. And the other one is Goober Hill. How would you like to say you're from Goober Hill? I haven't lived in center in over 30 years, but it still is a part of who I am. I like to say you can take the boy out of East Texas, but you can't get all the East Texas out of the boy. Part of my identity is made up of where I come from. Where we've been shapes who we are now. And maybe some of your identity comes out of your past. Maybe it's past mistakes and failures. You know, in addiction recovery groups, what do they say when they introduce themselves? I'm so-and-so, and I'm a recovering alcoholic or a recovering addict. That's their past, but it's still part of their identity today. It's how they identify themselves. It's true about them. Addiction is something that's true about them. And maybe for you, that's an abortion. Maybe that's part of your past. It's something that's true. Or a divorce. Or, or some other sin struggle in your past that you just can't seem to get past. That's something that's true about you. Maybe it's baggage that goes all the way back to your childhood. Maybe some of you, your identity comes out of what you've accomplished. And, and so it goes down to your education and the job that you have. What's one of the very first thing two dudes will talk about if they don't know each other well? What do you do for a living? Because that's something that's true about us. We derive some identity from what we do. We also get identity from the things we acquire, from the amount of money that we make. Those things drive identity. Maybe some of your identity comes from your desires. And that was certainly true for these Ephesians, because in Ephesus, you could go to the temple and there were prostitutes there that would feel, fulfill whatever desires you wanted. Still a huge issue today. We're told to define ourselves by whatever gender identity we want to have, whatever sexual preference we want to have. Those desires become who we are. Those desires begin to control us rather than us controlling our desires. But see, this quest to find identity through desire has caused a lot of problems in our society. It's caused anger and frustration and confusion. Things like what we should teach our kids in school about gender roles and gender identity. What, what surgeries kids should have to change their bodies and who gets to approve that? What, what bathrooms people go to? What pronouns we use? What sports teams we play on. But that shouldn't be the case. And, and if that's an area where you struggle, I would just lovingly tell you that God defined who you are. He gave you identity. He said you were made in his image and you were created as male or female. See, our, our desires shouldn't define us. Our past conduct shouldn't define us. Our accomplishments shouldn't define us. But just like those Ephesians, we've got all these things from our past that are competing with our identity in Christ. But here's what all of those competing identities have in common. They're all about what you've done. 
But our identity in Christ is all about what's been done for you. That's a big difference. He says our primary identity is not built around what we've done in the past, what we do right now, or our desires. Our primary identity is built in Jesus making us part of his family, that we are in Christ. And here's why that matters. Because we all have different backgrounds. We, we have so much that's not the same about us. We have different genders and races and nationalities. And those things are all true about us. But what is most true about us is that we are in Christ. So when all these competing identities start to take hold, maybe you start to hear that voice in your head, I'm I'm not good enough. Or, Or maybe it's some of those old temptations and failures and struggles that start to rear their head again. You've got to remind yourself about what's most true about you. And we make these decisions about things that are true about us all the time where we have to pick what's most true. Let me give you a couple of simple examples first. Uh, One of the things that's true about me is I'm kind of lazy at heart. I could have been a beach bum in another life. They lived on the beach and snorkeled and fished all day. So in the evening when I get home from the law firm or I get home from church, I just like to hang out with the family and, and really not work on sermons, not work on law firm stuff. Being lazy is something that's true about me. But something that's also true about me is I take my jobs very seriously and I want to have my sermon finished on Tuesday night before I go to bed for Sunday. And those two truths came into conflict this past Tuesday because between Mother's Day and the law firm being busy, I was way behind on sermon and this sermon was not written and it got to be Tuesday evening and suddenly I had two things in conflict, both true, I'm lazy, but I want to be done. And I had to pick between two things that are true. What's most true? And I decided what's most true is I wanted to get things done on time. And so I stayed up late into the evening, finishing up this sermon. You probably make that decision on a regular basis when you wake up in the morning and you think, I do not want to go to to, uh, work today. It's true. You don't want to go to work. What's also true is you want to get paid. You want to keep your job. And you have to decide in that moment, what's most true about you? We we make those decisions all the time about things that aren't sin, but the the stakes go way up when it involves sin. And and so maybe you're in a situation where there's an attractive coworker that's flirting with you at the office. And it's true that, man, you like the attention. It's also true that you like a little excitement in your life, but it's also true that you want to honor God and be faithful to your spouse. And so in that moment, you've got to decide what's most true and choose the thing that's most true about you. For you, maybe it's alcohol. Maybe you've struggled with an alcohol addiction in your past. You haven't had a drink in months, but you're out with your buddies and they're all drinking beer and it's true about you. You want a beer. That's something true. But it's also true that you never want to let alcohol destroy your family again. And in that moment, you've got to decide what's most true. Or maybe it's when you're bored and you're trying to decide, are you going to go to one of those websites? Are you going to look at those images on your phone? And you know that that desire, that's something that's true about you. But what's also true is that you've been called to be God's holy people. And in that moment, you have to decide what's most true. See, your primary identity, the thing that is most true about you, is that you are in Christ. That's who we are as God's people. And here's some things that the Bible says are also true about you when you are in Christ. You are loved. You are chosen. You are adopted. You're redeemed. You are forgiven. You are set free. You are holy. You are worthy. You are enough. You are accepted. You are sons and daughters of the King. That's who you are. Let's pray.